And welcome into Brewcast for Amazing Brew on the SB Nation Podcast Network. I'm Luke Yardy, joined by Anthony Broom and Chris Castellani here with you on Monday night, April 12th, headed into Tuesday, uh, April 13th. Coming to you live on both the Maze and Brew Twitch channel and for the first time ever, uh, the YouTube live page. So we already got some uh, people hanging out in the chat here on uh, both Twitch and YouTube. Appreciate all you guys uh, hanging out here. This is going to be a lot of fun. We've been trying to get on YouTube live for, for a while, but Anthony... He, he was able to get it figured out. He's the savant here, so he was able to, <laughs> to get it all going here. But uh, should be a fun show for you. Uh, obviously, had the spring game over the weekend. Going to talk a little bit about that, some interesting things. We're, we're going to imagine uh, what, what the spring game would have been like if we were able to see it. But before we get into it all, Anthony, Chris, what's going on, fellas? How are we doing here tonight? Doing well. I feel like uh, it's not that difficult. You just have to find a place and, and get the features you want, but... Um, that's for the people who are watching. We're happy for you to be here. I feel like the cavemen that uh, discovered fire, you know, so uh, <laughs> it's good to be here. Uh, good to be on both channels. The YouTube channel is trucking along almost, you know, we're kind of creeping up on over 3,600 followers there. So figured it was time to find a way to link up those things. And for the people that watch on Twitch, welcome. Uh, we, we are glad you're back with us too. So yeah, feeling good. Uh, first day of a uh, uh, health, a uh, renewed health kick for me, so I got a little bit of, little bit of energy. Not not a health. I'm not like a fitness jerk or anything like that, but just trying to eat better, make good choices. You know, some it's it's almost summer bod season, fellas. So gotta gotta take care of yourself. So <laughs> that's uh, right. But yeah, it's good to be back. Um, would have loved to. Well, we'll talk spring game. Would have loved to be at it and see it, but we'll get into that a little bit later. But uh, that's rolling along. Transfer portal and basketball is is a thing we've had some defections from the program of the nba draft so enough to do a pretty good show tonight for for both audiences here so welcome yeah for sure uh yeah this is one of those days and this is this is rare as i've known me for three years where i, I don't have a whole lot to say in regards to the introduction today uh, i mean I, the, you know what's weird is like the last few shows that we've done in the last few weeks were so taxing and draining just in regards to like what we were taught. It was so like, you know, e exhausting in a good way because it meant that they were playing for something. But now we're in like that, that kind of like, you know, grooving into the, the off season here, which I'm fine with. Cause this, <laughs> uh, you guys know, I to just getting on this show today was difficult for me with um, my, my computer trying to conk out on me. So glad to be here. I'm glad we're doing this. Gr glad we're trying it out on YouTube. Fun stuff. Yeah, this is uh appreciate everyone already in here. Andrew Dergs, Fluzz, Arctic, Nate, Tyler. I mean, this is uh it is pretty cool to be on YouTube for the first time. Appreciate you guys hanging out with us uh here tonight. So uh we, we did have the, the spring game over the weekend and I, I don't know if you guys feel the, the same way I do. It's like man, it's just everything surrounding the football program. It is just everything they do kind of just ticks me off right now, you know, <laughs> and I it's probably not fair to them, but I, I don't understand the whole thing about, you know, not televising. I, I don't think they allowed any media in there. I, I don't know how I don't know who was allowed uh, to get in the stadium because I know some people uh, were in there. I'm not really I'll tell sure you who wasn't in there. Me. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, why, like, like what? I, I don't think this was this COVID related, or was this like one of one of so, Harbaugh's like competitive advantage issue things? Yes, 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 yes. But I also think uh, this was from Austin Meek of the Athletic a few hours ago. Um, he said, since a few people asked, I'm told BTN gave schools a deadline to set a date on their spring games in order to coordinate remote coverage. Michigan's spring schedule was fluid, so that by the time the date was set. BTN had already booked programming. Um, I mm, don't buy that. Don't buy that. Um, <laughs> Same here, man. Okay. I'm glad I was I'm trying not to choose my words carefully. Yeah, I'll, I'll, some... I'll choose them for you. Yeah. Well, let me say this. Um, it is the year 2021. The three of us are here doing a podcast streaming. It, it may look like we're filming from, you know, a, a potato, but you know, it is, we're here. You can see us. You can hear what's going on. And let's let's call like again. First off, let me start off by saying this because I don't want to. I'm trying to organize my thoughts and not go off go off into rants and let you guys do your thing too. I think 
spring game not being televised and they're not being open practices and they're not really being a ton of hype over spring football anyways is a net positive for everyone to be honest with you given quite frankly the the, the toxicity that's lingering from last year that's lingering with the state of the program uh, there's not a ton to take away from these types of things anyways um, and, I, and I'll say you know, based on what we have seen heard know whatever nothing that really happened in the spring is all that unexpected and we'll talk about some things um, some storylines from it but I feel like at the end of the day like they live streamed the like the Big Ten Championship celebration and senior night stuff for the basketball program. If they wanted to stream this thing, they could have. And they would have gotten a lot of eyeballs on it too. Like I I can't speak for all of us, but I would be watching, if not for work reasons, out of sheer curiosity anyway. So mm-hmm. I don't know. It just in choosing my words wisely in case a Michigan SID happens to be watching, which shout out to you guys. You, you're you're awesome at your jobs and we appreciate the access we get from you. It just kind of feels like state controlled media right now. Like Mm -hmm. everything is fine. Don't don't look. We're good. Yeah. Just trust us that it's competitive and and cheery and everything's going the way of the Wolverines. I um even before last year, like just in general, I always found spring football and the spring game to be like pretty pretty silly. I, I just I never took much out of it. Uh, I, I understand people's excitement, I guess. I mean, we're, what, six months away from kickoff? Like, I don't know. That doesn't um, just doesn't do much for me. But, uh, yeah, I mean, you're you're more eloquent in your way of speaking, Anthony. Um, Can't say that very often. Th- than, <laughs> well, than, than I am about this. But, no, I mean, look, it's – um, it's the same reason the Tigers don't air spring training games. You know, if they were – if they felt better about – the, you know the, the future here if they felt better about the product uh they would have been more inclined to air it on television now i do agree with you that uh it is uh probably a net positive for for all parties that that you know they get to say release their own statements regarding how people looked in spring uh and it kind of keeps people off their backs for a while my counter argument to that would be i think it's it's toxicity that they have helped stir uh they did not do themselves any favors with how they went about uh, the, the contract situation this year uh, with Harbaugh. Uh, they didn't do themselves a- any favors with how they played a-, a season ago. You know, toxicity is typically created out of uh, underwhelming performance, you know, and, and especially in terms of the the uh, chorus of, of frustration uh, coming off of the fan base. So, no, I mean, it's – look, I, I do get it. Um, I'm not uh, – whether they air it or not is is – to me, it, it's, it doesn't mean much, but I, in terms of how the media is going to be able to portray it and how difficult it makes certain people's jobs, I wish that it would have aired because it would have given us something to talk about here. But I, I do, I, I can't say I empathize with that decision, but I get it. it think about the spring game is, I mean, I hope no one actually puts a whole lot of stock into it, but it's, it's just kind of nice to, to see football, you know, like yeah. that's, that's that's just the bread and butter, not only of the university, but but kind of just sports in this country, you know. And we're especially just reeling off the the elite eight loss, you know, for the basketball team. We were riding that high for a while. It it had been nice to see a little competition, but at the end of the day, someone's going to look good and someone's going to look bad in the spring game. You know, you take what you want out of it. You know, if if Cade McNamara looked amazing and was dicing up, you know, the first team defense or the the secondary. All of a sudden, it's either going to be Cade's going to be the guy this year is, is going to be half the fan base, you know, Cade for Heisman. The other side of the fan base is going to be like, wow, the secondary is not going to be good once again. You know, the, I mean, th- that's just what's going to happen in inter squad scrimmage. So, no, but it's you know what it is though. It's it's less about the game and it's more, hey, it's a nice and I don't, I mean, I don't right. really remember what I had for breakfast, but it's it's a nice spring. I don't remember what the weather was like Saturday, but it, nice spring day. It's, it's supposed to be just a fun thing. That's that's kind of what makes me ab- ab- upset about the the whole ordeal and wanting to keep it a secret. The spring game is literally just a a culmination, a celebration of the end of you know spring football, which is hard on a lot of guys. Uh, the conditioning and all the workouts that they go through. You know, it's nice to get some of the young guys a, a little bit of a head start. It gives you a little bit of a a jumping off point for the fall. But at the end of the day, man, it's just. Let's get out there. 
let's compete, let's have some fun, and, and it's just something for the fans to to kind of rally behind in the spring. Like that's all it is. It doesn't have to be any more than that. But this is almost like the um kind of the the old adage don't turn a one you know it's not exactly one to one here but don't turn a one day story into a two day story and that's like you just added the spring game people are going to have their takeaways and then forget about the spring game but when you try to keep it under wraps when you try to keep it a secret people are going to talk about it and be like well why couldn't we watch you know yeah i i totally get that and it's i think also part of it is we should probably uh, define what spring football typically is. It's you're you're getting the guys in that are the early enrollees. Uh, in Michigan's case, you have an entirely new staff on defense, so you're installing your your base packages. Your your all you're doing is setting a foundation. So when you come back for uh, you know camp and whenever it is late July, early August, you know that hey, our base front is a you know we run a three four defense. This is how you know. Just little things to build off from there. So, um, it's repetition. It's it's live installation of of things you want to do and things you want to be. So, again, and, and typically, and these, you'll even I'm not hating on any of the pace sites or anything like that. But a lot of them will tell you when they throw their little takeaway posts up is that the game was pretty vanilla. There wasn't much on each side and. Everything was pretty basic. Some guys who were considered to be big pieces of the team didn't play. Things like that. So television or no television, that's what the spring game typically is. I'll say this, though. Being on the field before the Citrus Bowl, saw Joe Milton throw a, a ball like 70 yards down the field, and that was enough serotonin to get me through the offseason. So, like, I right. feel like, you know, just give me give me a breadcrumb of something. I know there was the clip of J.J. McCarthy in practice. Uh, that went viral late last week. Um, you know, just give me, give me something, anything. Just, just give me a high to ride until, because like, um, you know, we have questions and and we'll get into our, you know, putting together a preseason content plan as we speak. But you know, it just there's just no, there's just not a lot of juice with them right now. Um, there's no excite. Like I just remember six years ago, Harbaugh comes in and it's kind of like he's kind of like uh, I said this on someone else's podcast today. He's sort of like a carnival barker, which step right up and see what's going on here. We're doing this. We're doing this. We're doing satellite camps. We're doing signing with the stars, you know, uh, and, and they haven't earned that type of attention in the last couple of years, uh, namely in the last calendar year or so. But there's just everything just seems like it's going through the motions right now. And not to get too negative, but it just it feels it just feels very routine. Most yeah. importantly, though. I, I got to say, uh, I love the all blue jerseys, man. The all blue uniforms. I like, I thought, I remember when they went all maze for that Florida game mm -hmm. uh, to kick off the, the 2017 season. I wasn't sure exactly how I felt about it, but it looked great out there on the field. That's, that's kind of from the pictures I saw. I'm like, I know that's a that's a thing that kind of splits the fan base a little bit, man. But I'd be down for for a game with the All Blues here this year. Totally cool with it. Uh, bring back Maze pants on the road, though. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's, yeah that's the, probably my the favorite. white pants have the white pants have, have kind of just run their course a little bit, you know. It's a it's it's fine, but you know Michigan like. I'm glad that they're not like like everyone says Oregon, but Michigan State seems like they have a different uniform they wear every week. I like that Michigan has, you know, one of the three, four, five best kind of combinations in college football. And I don't mind the Maze jersey. Um, all I know is that some of the things that Adidas did in that era of the horrendous. Oh my god! Like the tire the, the, tracks on the jerseys. The the Dave Brandon era was a was a difficult era for uh <laughs> dude for, for jerseys, man. <laughs> How are how are we gonna look? Just look back at the Dave Brandon era, like twenty years down the road, just like how high was everyone at that moment that every that that this is what happened with Michigan athletics? If you were to ask me what is the defining image of the Dave Brandon era, it is the picture of the giant craft macaroni and cheese noodle, like outside, <laughs> like outside the Big House scoreboard. Remember how? That God, that was so long ago. You remember how people flipped out over that? Yeah. I think oh that yeah. Was Hoke was still around, but yeah. Um, yeah, it's. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, history. 
football was a disaster. A lot of things are kind of a disaster under him, but I do think history will look back fondly on him in terms of the upgrades to Chrysler Center, the upgrades yeah. mm-hmm. to the big house. I mean, a lot of the thing, everything on that athletic complex that's new in like the last 10 years, most of it, I should say, is yeah. his fingerprints are on that. So a little tip of the I- hat to, to him. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna say that I think the lasting image for me is gonna be Devin Gardner wearing number ninety eight on the the Legends jerseys. Oh, yeah, oh, okay. <laughs> that was uh, that was so ill informed doing that. Um, yeah. Ugh. I'm just oh, there's a yeah. We, we got a question there uh, sure, on right. on YouTube. Is anyone worried about no D coordinator experience from anyone on that side from Tyler Anderson? Um, play calling. That that is uh it, obviously it's a bit of a concern, but you also have two guys that are on that side that that came from the NFL ranks. And as as a Cowboys fan, I, I can say that uh you know you, you might not want anyone that was on the staff on the the Cowboys side last year. I was going to ask uh, you about that because I read something. <laughs> I think it was Richard Johnson's piece for Five Thirty Eight where uh, Cowboys people thought that because Mo. What was Mo Lingwis' role with them? He was just the secondary coach? Uh, DB, DB coach. Okay. Someone said that, or in that article, it said that all he did when he came to Michigan was change the logos on the PowerPoints yeah. that he showed them last year. Should we be worried about that? <laughs> um, I mean, it, it wasn't great, but it, w- it was really a combination of things on the... It wasn't just like guys were getting dusted every play you know, in the secondary part of it had to do with uh, some injuries, Anthony Brown, Chidobe Awuzie going down for, for a little while, uh, kind of playing Jordan Lewis out of position and out of technique a little bit. Um, uh, it, that's the thing that worries me is, are you going to be able to adapt the personnel? You get a lot of these guys that, that come from the NFL, right? And it's system, system, system. And it, it's almost, it's almost Don Brown like. It's just a different system where, regardless of what players you have and what type of players you have, they think they can plug and play, and their system is king. And that's what I worry about. And that's what I was a little bit worried about with that that PowerPoint that you talked about. And I don't really know what the roles roles are because it's it's linguist and McDonald that are code D coordinators, right? Yeah. Like who, who's going to get the play calling? Mike McDonald's going to call the uh, my understanding I shouldn't assume. Mike McDonald's going to call the plays and I think that linguist is more kind of like installing the coverages and things like that. Um okay. and, and we've seen we've we've seen these co-defensive coordinator things before. Uh it's kind of a more recent thing, but it's um to answer your question Tyler, like yeah, I, that's re- really any addition they were going to make is a concern, right? Because there's just so much unknown, but uh the Ravens people will tell you that Mike McDonald was probably going to be the next defensive coordinator after Wink Martindale. I think that's more of a kind of a PR machine. Type. I, I I don't know that to be the case or not. He seems like a bright guy, and, and I'm looking forward to see what he does. Uh, you know, probably you're going to see a lot more like this. This will be a three four, or you know, I see this being an odd front defense. Like that's what the depth chart suggests it will probably be too. So I'm intrigued by the standing D ends, man. Yeah, is Aiden a Hutchinson Clay gonna, Matthews action going? You know, is Aiden Hutchinson going to be a stand-up linebacker? Like, I, I, don't, I think they're prepping him for that. But that's that's what it sounds like. It's going to be interesting. I'm, I'm, I am genuinely looking forward to that because there are some players on that defense still, and um, I don't know. Well, there are players on both sides of the ball. It's just will they be coached better? Yeah, uh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, but my, the one, the one response I have is that. Over the last several years, they've had a lot of guys with D coordinator experience, and um, look where it's got them. And so I, I understand the concern completely, but the one bit of credit that I that I have to give Harbaugh is it's very clear he's not content with the results, and, and I like I give him credit for constantly trying to adapt and make changes. Like it's obvious that there is that some fire there still. Uh do we have reason to be skeptical? A million percent. And I completely get Tyler's concern with it, but um what wasn't what we had before wasn't working. So they decided to make a change. And if it means less experience on this staff this year, so be it. Uh, it what what they need is results and hopefully yeah. the staff can bring them that. I, I will say this. I think that there is a – like if you bring in someone that's got a ton of D coordinator experience and call them plays, they might be 
there, there's a case to be made about being more stuck in their ways, you know, and more stubborn because they, they've called plays before rather than someone like Mike McDonald coming in that, I don't know, might be open to, to trying a couple new different things. Now, obviously, that could crash and burn, but I, I think it's better than the alternative that we saw the last two years as well. Yeah, that's why I said, like, they Jim Harbaugh, he signed an extension, but we've said this a million times. It's kind of just stability on paper. Like, he's still very much coaching for his job, um, you know, moving forward. So for him to be able to, like, you were going to have to go out and take chances with who you brought in because Will Muschamp wasn't coming here, not knowing if Jim Harbaugh was only going to be here for a year or not. Derek Mason, same type of deal. So I prefer rolling the dice on a guy like Mike McDonald as opposed to, hey, let's go out and get this 60-year-old guy who is looking for a retirement gig and can kind of do what Don Brown did. Uh, yeah, I'm fine with I'm fine with the overhauls. I'll I will say this though. I think that uh, I think that buys. I do think that this is a two-year thing for Harbaugh. I don't think this is his last year, unless they totally, you know, go six and six or worse, which I suppose could happen given how bad they were last year. I feel like every given how much that is new, I just it feels like 2015 reversed and start all over again. So that's how I feel about that. Are are you guys buying into the hype machine at all from this game? You know, I saw a lot of Andre Anthony getting a lot of love. I I, I would have in years past, and that's <laughs> you know, like like oh man, and I feel like I probably am going to start buying the hype again come like August, you know. But I this is this was the big test for me, and it did nothing for me when in years past it would have, and, and I'm yeah. like man. Am I a changed man, or, or have I just been beaten down enough by by this program that I'm not going to buy into it? I just, I it did nothing for me. It's like that's, Andre that's Anthony, huge game, going to be a beast. But I'm like, that's what I'm yeah. saying. Like the fact that there wasn't a spring game is probably good for people like you because you'd be like, <laughs> oh man, Cade McNamara <laughs> let him right down the field, boys. Here we go. Who's doing this the Cade the McNamara Heisman edit this year? Uh, we'll get Ben Silverman on it. He's he's I, on contract here. So. I think I think last year, in terms of mood, just it just changed a lot for a lot of people. And, and I know like Michigan is are the kings of spring Heisman's preseason Heisman's preseason favorite to do. But like I I really yeah this is I'm with you Luke. Like this was the first year where I'm like I. I've we've officially reached the I'll believe it when I see it stage, um, which you know, you know what that's not the worst place to be because it does it you know taper expectations a little bit, uh, but you know they start off one and two then you know it, the the torches and pick, pitchforks are going to be out again. And oh, it won't even take out. two losses. It'll take the first it, it, incomplete pass of the first game. <laughs> right, <laughs> the first <laughs> first run up the middle that goes for no yards. Yeah. If no, they start right. the season like they started the 2016 season, it is going to be pitchforks coming out immediately. Wilton Spate throwing an interception on oh the opening gosh. play. Yeah, yeah. Um, Could you imagine? That Washington game is going to be pretty telling um, on that second week of the year uh, because from there, like your first. Does Giles games, get to play in that game? You think? Like, like, does he? Is he going to play right away? All I mean, everyone's be. eligible now. It's the Wild West, so. Imagine said, Giles oh, taking like the opening kickoff back to the house, like you did against Maryland. Yeah, the, God, it, it's it's Western Michigan, Washington, or Northern Illinois, then Rutgers. So like, you're hoping you start at least like. To be frank, it, like if Michigan is back, and by back now that means eight wins, nine wins, you win all four of those games, and then you go to Wisconsin and to Nebraska. So those are the two games. Those first two weeks of October. And who knows? You might know that second weekend in September, like what you're dealing with here. But mm-hmm. yeah, that's those those Wisconsin Nebraska games, and then you come home and play Northwestern. That's kind of where you'll know it's going to be like that a couple years ago. You're going to know before Halloween if this team what they are or not. So I, I don't see there being false hope um, heading into the last week of the year unless they run the table. So I don't know. I just feel like this is a two year plan now. So. The hype train, not upset about it, not chugging along. I think that's that's needed for everyone. I honestly, I felt this myself uh, coming off of basketball. I felt like we all just needed a break, a couple weeks off. Or I wonder if that had something to do with it. 
me not getting is that like we didn't yeah. get that like couple of weeks, you know. Well, let's. We haven't seen Michigan play since I think their last game was that Thanksgiving weekend against Penn State. So they haven't. They didn't finish their season. There hasn't really been a ton of outside of the Harbaugh news and, and the coaching staff, which is stuff that was done in January. There hasn't been a whole lot of anything going on. So, but like like I said, I, it's a lack lack of hype in spring practice. I think is good for everyone because we all need they need the detox. We need the detox. And you know what? If they come out this year and they win nine games, win God forbid ten games, and it will be a, you know because they didn't talk to the media a couple extra times or because they didn't televise and let fans in the spring game. I suppose it will be worth it, but again, it's just it is disappointing because you know you have people who I won't call myself an expert, but again, it's, this is my full time job. You have other people in the media who are paid to report and discuss and analyze what's going on, and it just and they don't care about the media. Like that's they don't. It's fine. It, there's always been kind of an animosity there between the media and Harbaugh. That's just the kind of dude he is. But it's it's upset, like, a lack of transparency sets the table for uh, misinformation and for, again, kind of the whole propaganda, state-controlled media type of thing. So it's just disappointing. I'm not upset about it. I, I don't think any of us are, are crying because we didn't have to watch Big Ten Network on at 2 o'clock on a Saturday. But it is, it is disappointing just because, and this isn't the first time they haven't, televise a spring game it's i feel like jim harbaugh michigan's only had like two or three spring games under jim harbaugh the others have been wiped out due to weather or Mm -hmm. uh, this panini thing we're dealing with so i don't know it it doesn't just it doesn't register to much for me it's just disappointing you got anything to add chris no (laughs) (laughs) i'm I'm not i'm not thinking this far ahead man i can't get into football right now well uh, I, d- I do want to shift gears uh, a little bit here for this uh, last little stretch of the show because um, because we do got some basketball to talk, obviously, some news. Uh, Mike Smith, Shondi Brown going to be foregoing that you know option to come back in the last year, both going to be pursuing uh, the NBA draft. Obviously, I don't think – I think Mike Smith was a little bit of a surprise, but not much. Shondi wasn't a surprise at all to me. I know there was some talk about maybe him coming back, but – I thought when he came, he he made it pretty clear that this was going to be his last year playing college basketball, and and maybe you know the the only thing that I was going off was that maybe uh, it, it changed with the run that they were on, but uh, that that one didn't surprise me. Mike Smith surprised me a tad, but not not a whole lot. But um, uh, sounds like I don't think this has been confirmed. Uh, Eli Brooks sounds like he's leaning pretty hard towards coming back, though. Correct? Yeah, nothing official right now, but. Mike Smith, Chandy Brown, gone. Those were made official. And, and I can't say those were too surprising because I, from the jump, when we started talking to them you know, via the Zooms and things like that, those were two guys that seemed pretty intent on just playing the one year. Uh, but there, you know, discussions were had. See what you can do. And we talked about this before too. The seniors that come back don't count against the scholarship limit for next year. So right. it's basically a freebie. Now, things appear to be trending in the right direction with Eli Brooks. Uh, it would just be a fifth year for him. So uh, I think uh, based on what I've been told slash heard, I think there's some additional educational stuff he'd like to take part in at Michigan, maybe pertaining to a master's degree or things like that. So, but yeah, that would be a big one for them because he bring, I don't know if he's a guy that runs the point. You might still dip into the transfer portal for that. And you know that's the other thing they need to sort out is who's still available. Franz Wagner has a decision to make, which we are expecting him to go pro eventually when when that comes. But you'll have other trans. You might have some other transfers too, and we won't speculate or throw names out. But it's always possible when you see again the term Wild West come comes up again. That's kind of where the transfer portal is right now. It's free agency guys looking for an opportunity to play. So uh, things are looking good with Eli Brooks until a decision happens. I don't know if we should really or if we can really discuss what the fallout of that is until we see how this roster comes together. But it does seem like that Michigan, one, will be able to take advantage of the extra year rule. And two, it seems like that Juwan Howard might 
take a little dip his toes into the portal again, see if he can duplicate some of that magic from last year. Uh, two players that I'm going to hold in very high regard, despite only playing one year here. I mean, I Mike Smith um, was phenomenal. He that was the big question mark really coming into the season was how are they going to replace Xavier Simpson and I love Z but I that that was one of the reasons I always thought Michigan was going to be better than people were predicting them to be because Xavier Simpson was a great effort guy he he filled his role he filled his role <laughs> very well <laughs> yeah right Sorry. yeah uh, there's your little highlight for the day the dog tackling me on the live stream. All right. Carry on. We, Sorry. We good? My bad. I didn't expect that to happen. We good? We're good. Okay. Uh, <laughs> but it's, Z was Z was great, but he's you know he he had flaws. And, and uh, Sm- Mike Smith came in and did a tremendous tremendous job playing the point. Johnny Brown was everything for this team, and then some. I mean, to call it a home run in the transfer portal is the understatement of the century. I he was one of the key pieces to that team's run they don't make it to the third round they don't make it to the second weekend of the tournament if not for the game he played against lsu two awesome uh awesome uh uh, transfers two awesome home runs hit by juan howard yeah it's look brooks coming back would be wonderful Uh, i even if he does come back uh, juan's gonna have the decision of uh do we do we allow Zeb Jackson to step into that starter's role or do we try for another person in the transfer portal? My guess would would be they try somebody else out at the, in the transfer portal. There is also the option of letting Brooks uh, run the point and uh, as a starting point guard. I, I, I've never liked that option. I just think he works better as a wing. I, I think he seemed very, very comfortable in Juwan's offense uh, this year and really uh, in, in 2020 as well. Um, coming into, you know, fulfilling a role there. Um, yeah, he's going to have some decisions to make, but look, I basically every first year guy, some of them only playing for one year that Juwan has picked up thus far, you could throw a uh, front saving Franz Wagner and, and, and bringing him into the program after beeline left, uh, has been like, has exceeded expectations to an insane amount. And some of those guys are still unproven. Like Zeb is still unproven. Terrence Williams is unproven, but I, I, I'm giving Juwan the benefit of the doubt here. I think they're going to be wonderful players. Hunter Dickinson was the Big Ten Freshman of the Year, second team All-American. Shondi was awesome. Mike Smith was awesome. Um, I, we're at a point now where whatever personnel he decides to bring in, I think it's going to be the right choice. Yeah, it's going to be interesting. To, this this is going to be really telling on how he's going to run the program, right? Like, because we just saw Baylor win a national championship with with a bunch of transfers on that team. It's it's not like. It's it's interesting how college basketball kind of goes through eras. Obviously, we've had the quote unquote one and done era, you know, for the for the last I don't know thirteen years or so. Uh, but it's kind of I, I think it's going to be transitioning into a transfer era, and that's why you almost have to make a decision because if you bring in, you know, just throwing a name out, a guy like Marcus Carr or something like that, you know, just just shoot for the moon on an incredible player like that. If you bring him in to run the point and, and kind of dominate the ball, Zeb Jackson's minutes are obviously going to be pretty limited. We saw flashes from Le- Zeb Jackson, obviously uh, a super talented guy, but is he going to want to stick around? If that happens, you know, that that's that's the era we're in. We're, we're in the transfer portal era, and, you, and you're going to play it like that. Are you going to stick around if you're a player to to be a, a three-year guy and wait in the wings to get your shot? And and if you're a college basketball program, are, are you going to try and kind of homegrown talent, you know, so to speak? So it's going to be interesting to see what Jawan does, and that's going to be kind of the, the telltale moving forward of what kind of program he's going to be running. Yeah, and I trust him. I trust him with my life. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what else to put it. Uh, he hit. He, I mean, you could sit like Baylor set the bar with, by winning a national title. He set the bar for the the senior guys that come in, like a like a Mike Smith from the Ivy League. Maybe this opens up opportunities for those guys who didn't get to play this year. Um, you know, take your pick. Any anyone he brings in, and that's. You have to caution against an unfair expectation, too, because I think that he nailed it so well with this first go-round that mm-hmm. you know you don't want guys to be held to 
that I mean, you hope they're you're they're held to that same standard, but is that guy that comes in going to be as impactful as Mike Smith was, as transformative of his own personal game for the benefit of the team as Mike Smith was? Uh, same deal with Shondy. I mean, he could start for he could have started for almost any team in that tournament field, and at Michigan, it just so happened his role was to come off the bench. So we'll see what happens. It's it's going to be an interesting test. I think that they will prioritize guys that fit the culture as opposed to the most talented guy. Like, like I, I don't know who that takes them in or puts them in or out of the running for, but they're going to stick to that. And, and if, if they, if they whiff on the transfer portal and all that happens is Eli Brooks comes back, they have the number one recruiting class in basketball coming in next year. Right. So right. it's kind of a, uh, you know, it's a win-win across the board is the way yeah. I see it. So, I believe him. Are are you guys surprised? I, I've been a little surprised that we haven't heard from Franz or Isaiah because both I'm I'm sure are going to at least enter their names into the NBA draft. I, I'm sure Franz will stay in. Uh, I, I'm sure Isaiah is going to want to get some feedback, especially as it pertains to his injury. But I I don't really know. What, I I don't know what the holdup is for a lot of these guys. You know, I mean, it it only makes sense to enter your name if you're those two for sure because you still yeah. have the the deadline to come back. So I don't know. Uh, I, I just find, I find it odd. I, I don't know if this is, well, is it later than normal or they spent a month in Indianapolis. So maybe get a week of sleep in your own bed first and then, right. Yeah. And then make yeah. those decisions yeah. uh, for a guy like livers. And I, I don't have inside info on this. I'm not speaking for him, but the guy had the, the last two seasons of his year taken from, or the last yeah. two seasons of his career taken from him Yeah, due to COVID due to injuries. I just don't, I don't see him. I see him rehabbing and, and just trying to grind in his way into an NBA roster. I don't see him yeah. coming back because I don't know. It just it seems unlikely. Uh, Franz, again, he's probably just. It was an emotional year for a lot of these guys, so I don't blame them for unplugging for a week. And has Cade Cunningham technically declared for the draft yet? Did I miss that? Have some of these other guys declared for the draft yet? I just think it was just so exhausting of a season that. You're just seeing guys just kind of chill for a bit. Like we chilled. They didn't watch their team's spring football games either. They just <laughs> relaxed, which is what I'm looking for. Actually, to. yeah, actually, I don't know. Have those guys declared? Because I, I just saw Aaron Henry do it today, and I haven't really been, I don't know, paying all that, that close of attention to everyone else, ju- just mostly seeing what the Michigan guys are doing. Because I just, you yeah. know, assuming a guy like Cade's going to go, you know, obviously he's going to be a number one pick. But yeah, I, I guess I, I don't. I haven't seen anything official on like Jalen Suggs or anything like that either. So, yeah, maybe it's yeah. just a uh, yeah. Give you us, know, got plenty of time. time to do it. What the hell, hey? Yeah, no one's going anywhere. So, um, well, you want to take some questions? We kind of just got a big little boost in viewers here, so we could do that to to end the show. Yeah, ab- absolutely. Uh, yeah, anyone's got questions uh, going on? We got a hype train going on over there on, on Twitch from. Pride of Detroit raiding our party, apparently. Oh, is that what's going on? Our Pride of Detroit friends joined us. So welcome. Welcome, fellas. We'll, we'll stick on. Fellas, ladies, I shouldn't just assume. Uh, we'll take some questions here. One of them from earlier was from Andrew Decker. It said, Aiden is still not ready for full contact. It was a normal close for the scrimmage from the pictures and clips I've seen. Hopefully hits the ground running when cleared. Uh, I believe that he kind of is is technically ready to come back and go. Uh, but they just, you know, what's, again, spring football, what's the point of rushing that guy back? That's a that's a guy where if he gets right this year and he stays healthy, he could be a top, like he could be a first-round pick. So, mm. um, or at least a second-round pick. I don't know. But, and that's where it's going to be interesting to see if they do move him and do some rush linebacker things with him and move him around. He could play with his hand in the dirt, uh, obviously, but would love to see him do that as well. Uh, kind of in like one of those TJ Watt, type of role so yeah i i don't that's not a concern to me i he'll that guy will be ready he's 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 a machine so he'll be ready to go when it's time he's gonna get to do what we were hoping rashawn gary was gonna get to do and kind of what he's doing with the packers a little bit you know yeah what, can actually contribute <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> Sta- yeah stand up and just get after it man let's take, you know let's take a moment to remember that Michigan had him playing run anchoring defensive end. No, I know. I I liked Rash- I like Rashawn Gary a lot. I, mean, I just it's low low hanging. I also like to point out that the defenses were pretty damn good when he was doing right. that. And you know I what? I mean, he he and sacrificed for the team. I'll give him that. That guy, I 
that guy was a team player. And I'll, I'll mm-hmm. go to my grave saying this. I know people wanted to see 15 sacks a year because he was the number one recruit in the country. But in playing the role that he did, he was he was eating up oftentimes three three blocks at once. That's why Chase Winovich feasted at Michigan. That's mm-hmm. why some of those other guys feasted when he was U- there. Uche, so, yeah. Yeah, there, there will be no Rashawn Gary slander on my timeline. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, uh, uh, let's see what we got here. Oh, it's from CFB Attic. Power forward starter, Brandon Johns or Musa Diabate? Ooh. I, th- I think I, John. We could, we I, I think, could I think have, John's here. We could have an Austin Davis situation where he starts the year. Um, but it, John's was John's was good. John's had a nice year last. Like, I know he's frustrating as a player, but – I I actually think that NCAA tournament run is going to do just wonders for his confidence. He even alluded to it. He said, "I'm more confident now than I've ever been." Uh, I think I, Juwan likes him. I think there's something to be said about having that experience in the starting five too. Like I, I've talked about it before. Unless you're what was it, Duke in 15 and Kentucky in 2012, you don't you don't win Natty's playing you know three four freshmen in, in your in your starting lineup. You do need that experience. Brandon Johns has been through a heck of a lot here. Two coaches, a pandemic. A lot of ups, a lot of downs. Um, I, I, th- I think he'll he'll fill in and be in the starting role uh, to begin next season. Yeah, if you had the eventual uh, Big Ten freshman of the year starting the season on the bench, there's probably a good yep, chance this is going to be point. starting on the bench, man. Yep. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah, and, and I don't. I actually don't mind it. I, I think Brandon Johns going to take is going to bring some good experience to the table. Uh, granted that he stays, you know, we're we're kind of just assuming that he's going to be here, but obviously that could change at any given moment, given the, uh, the the transfer portal and everything like that, you know, and in, in kind of the era we're in. But if Brandon Johns is here, I think he's going to be your starting four. Yeah, yeah, and that's if Brandon Johns is here. And I'm not saying like it's possible. You never know. Maybe someone, maybe there's a surprise transfer. If there was a surprise transfer off this roster, like David DeJulius was last year, he might be a guy to watch. I, I'm just, Possibly. you know, we'll see. Uh, there's a lot, lot to sort out still, but yeah, if, if he's here, I think he starts because I think he's figured it out. So uh, it's from, from Jack Vanden Bosch. Who's the starting point guard next? I'm assuming that's next year. Yeah. We just kind of talked about that. I, I assume my guess would be, so right now, you have, of the guys projected to be on the roster, you have Frankie Collins, who'd be a freshman, and Zeb Jackson, who I think I think he can run the point, but he's more of a combo guy. I think they might dip into the transfer portal. I do. Yeah, I do too. Yeah. If you, uh, if you give me if you give me odds on it, Brooks Jackson or transfer guy, I'm going with transfer for Same. sure. I, I don't know. I, I don't know if if Kobe's going to be a guy that's going to run point either, but no, I know he, again, he's, ca- he's kind of a two too, you know? Yeah. So that's the depth. I like the young depth they have in kind of that combo guard spot. And I don't hate the idea of turning things over to Frankie Collins and just letting him roll. But I think that, uh, you know, that might impact. I, th- I think Zeb, I think Zeb would get the look over Frankie Collins, to be honest with you. He might, he you might, know, just Frankie Collins just, is a top 50 guy though. So. Yeah, Zeb just uh, or Jawan just feels like he, he likes the experience a little more, you know. Yeah, yeah. and I think it's he's going to want who who the the guy who plays point guard on this team is going to be a distributor of the basketball, and of the guys projected to be on the roster, again, unless they go out and get a transfer, Frankie Collins is probably the most well equipped to do that. So it would be exciting if he was able to come in and start right away, uh, but we'll see what happens. So yeah. thanks for the question, Jack. Uh, we got time for what? Maybe two more here? Yeah. Uh, do, 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 do. Do, do, do. Sorry, we're, we're doing it live. Um, Tyler, any rumors on Saudi Washington or Hi- Howard Isley being plucked away? Not really right now. Uh, Saudi I mean, Easter, chance- Easter just made a hire today. So, I mean, if there was somewhere Saudi was going to go, it was maybe there. Well, Saudi is a Western alum, I believe. Mm-hmm. Yeah, turned him uh, down he, last year. He turned him down last year. Unless, hey, we don't want him to leave Michigan, but can we all kind of do our little witch witch's coven thing here? And there's an opening up in Mount Pleasant. What do you, what yeah, do you right. I, I would say? I would take Saudi and Mount P. I know that. Speak it yeah. into existence. Um, I, I, I think what Saudi's doing is smart because I don't think he wants to. 
I don't think he wants to build up. Like, I think there's going to be a big job, not like Kentucky or something like that, but you know what I mean, like a power five job that's going to open up in the near future that he is waiting on. Um, because I think, really, you're going to get more coverage right now as an assistant at Michigan than you are, and this is, I mean, yeah, it, it is a knock against the Mac, but it's true, uh, are being a head coach at Western or, or, or Eastern or any of those places. I, I think that uh, the, the, the coverage that he gets, the praise that he gets, deservedly so, I think he's going to be a whale of a coach wherever he ends up going. I think he's content kind of lying in wait right now until that perfect opportunity goes, you know, opens up. But as far as rumors, no, I haven't heard anything right now regarding Saudi. Um, it's a little bit, um, it's only been a week or two since the season, but I feel like it's getting a little bit late in the game at this point where we would, we would have known by now, but you never know. Somebody could end up resigning late. Somebody could end up getting, you know, quitting or being fired. But yeah, I haven't, I haven't heard anything currently. I would say the one, like, some people think he's waiting out for like a bigger job and, and that's certainly that seems to be the case. I mean, I, I could be wrong, but I believe he was at least interviewed for the Michigan job before Jawan Howard got it. He was, uh, I, he was with Greg Campy at Oakland for 10 years. I wonder if Campy ever re- like when Campy retires, cause he's been there for like forever since, since the eighties, 84, I think. I wonder if that might be a place but I think he can do better than that. No disrespect to our our Grizzly fam out there, but I don't know. And Howard Isley, there's been rumblings here and there. I think maybe Boston College we heard about with him, but haven't heard much on that front either. Um, so yeah, I think everyone's I think everyone's still on board. Uh, we got another question here uh, from Twitch Mind of Malice. Says, do you think Phil Mar- Phil Martello? That's Phil Martelli finishes his career and retires here at Michigan. I think that this is probably his last coaching gig. Yeah. Yes. Um, I know that things he spent are enough years, man, out out in the Northeast. Like he, he's put in his time for sure. I think he's pretty content where he's at. Yeah. And mind of Mel did correct uh, themselves here. So uh, Phil Martelli. Yes. Um, I know it's difficult. So his wife is still on the East coast, I believe. And he was locked down in Ann Arbor, you know, throughout this year to make sure they could get this season played. So, and they, I, I just think, at some point, the man will want to enjoy, you know, enjoy his later years and enjoy life after basketball. And I think that that situation right now, while it's it's something he embraces, um, you know, how difficult the, the family thing is, I think at some point, yeah, it's. I, I think that this will be it for him. It would have it would have to be the perfect scenario in which a, a program is kind of left in a difficult spot. And they bring him in under the pretense of, hey, we, we don't – similar to Beeline, where it's like we just – we don't want you here long-term. We know you're not going to be here long-term. Coach for two, three years, um, and, and, you know, stabilize the program, and then we'll, we'll give you a nice thank you bonus on the way out. Um, but again, I don't, I don't see that because I think, you know, the, the type of – what he's getting at Michigan right now is, is equal to what he may do two or three years at a, a, another school. I think that he's – I think he's very content with where he's at. I, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, like I said, like he spent what thirty some odd years at St. Joe's or something like that. I just I, he was there for for seemingly ever. And, and at this at this point, it's like I, first of all, I think he loves where he's at, being the associate, you know, head coach. I think he loves Juwan Howard and, and the culture that they've built. You know, the the real family thing. And like after all those years, man, does he really want to go somewhere and try and rebuild? Because coach openings happen for a reason you know uh unless unless a guy leaves for the nba or something like what happened at michigan with john b line you know there, there's a reason coaching vacancies happen and it's usually not not a good thing so if he if he does go somewhere i would be shocked i do think that he's going to finish out his career uh at michigan i would agree with that and someone tested me at the end of the the, the live stream with a question it's gone you're blocked so, yeah. <laughs> uh, let's close this out before we get some other yahoos in here. All righty. So, uh, well, we'll start with Chris. Where can we find you on social media? And and uh, I know you got a lot going on with the Lockdown Tigers. What uh, what's all going on with you, man? Uh, at uh, at 2014 on Twitter, uh, doing the uh, daily post game videos again for the lowly Tigers. Uh, as Jonathan Scope is about to strike out with the bases loaded here in the first inning. Uh, yeah, please hit a grand slam. It'd be amazing if I was wrong about that. But um, yeah, uh, 
Tigers are still terrible, uh, but uh, in in this year I'm skinny, so it's a little bit different than it has been <laughs> in, in the past. Um, there you'll find the link to my YouTube page. I've been doing some pretty fun stuff there. And Jonathan Scope strikes out in a changeup. Uh, at Locked on Tigers on Twitter, you'll find my other uh, podcast there for the Locked on Podcasting Network. Been doing some fun stuff with that. A lot of crossover shows, some interviews. Um, and, of course, just recapping the days that were uh, for the Detroit Tigers. And I'm on Instagram as well, updating stories, posting stuff, posting little snippets of my post-game videos. Chris Castle, 95. Uh, please follow me on uh, all those platforms. The man does and, the Anthony, I usually, uh, I usually ask you about your socials, but you've been kind of veering from that as of late. So I'll just, I'll just uh, give the floor to you, <laughs> and, and anything you want to you use the time for is yours. Well, I was going to say uh... – Chris Castellani is the most talented man in the game. He does live play-by-play, too. So uh, <laughs> I wear many hats, Anthony. He does. Uh, yeah, you can follow me on Twitter at Anthony T. Broom. You know all the other stuff. So I don't have anything else to say. Just uh, appreciate everyone who came along in the maiden YouTube voyage. Uh, they'll get better. Again, there's just not a lot to talk about right now. We, <laughs> I'm surprised we almost got a half hour of football talking, given that we didn't see anything this weekend. And we haven't seen anything for the last you know two months since they started spring practice. But... Uh, it's good to have you guys here. Uh, you know where to get our shows. So it's it's on the ticker below here. So, you know. You can find me on Twitter at Luke Giardi, L-U-K-E-G-H-I-A-R-D-I. Just my name for those of you in the uh, the, the Twitch and the YouTube chat here. Big thanks to everyone that, that joined us watching not only on Twitch, but YouTube Live for the first time. That was a lot of fun. Big thanks to, to all the questions. Uh, so much fun when you guys are, are engaged and asking some questions, man. We love you. And uh, appreciate you tuning in. For those listening on the podcast, make sure uh, to, you know, if, if you want, you, we do this live every Monday, usually about 730. We'll send out a tweet for you. Uh, so so make sure to follow, as Anthony said, uh, follow the Maze and Brew Twitter and and whatnot. But, uh, no, really appreciate you guys. And, if, by the one, way, Stephen. If, if, you, if you subscribe to the YouTube page, you will get notified when we go live. So, oh yeah, there you go. Subscribe. I was just gonna say, time. subscribe to the YouTube page. We got Stephen Os- uh, Osentowski here. Uh, he does some great work, man. He does a lot of recaps and everything like that. Go check out his videos uh, as well. It's well worth the the subscription to the YouTube page, and it's free. So you know, there you go. You don't even have to pay for for all that good content. So appreciate all you guys, man. And uh, yeah, that, that's gonna about wrap it up for us here. So for my partners, Anthony Broom and Chris Castellani, I'm Luke Yardi, and we'll see you next week on Brewcast.